It's Brad Nyhauser with Colwell Bankers Shook in Lafayette. Hello, Brad. Good morning, Dan. Where are we? What are we doing here today? Today, we are at a different place than we normally are. We're at the West Lafayette Purdue University Airport. Is this your airplane? This is my airplane. You know, usually on these videos, Dan, we talk about business. We're in front of a farm or we're in front of a building. Today, we're going to talk about what I do for fun, what I do for play. You know, not everyone flies an airplane or not everyone. Some people play golf. I don't play golf, but I fly an airplane. Um, I've had my pilot's license since I was 18 years old. No kidding. I'm 62 now, so somebody can do the math. That's a lot of years. I haven't flown all those years because as one designated examiner told me when I got my instrument check right, he said, what's it take? What makes an airplane fly? Of course, you say the wings, <clears throat> the engines. He said, no, it's money and a lot of it. And that I agree with. <laughs> so when you're 18 years old, you don't have any money. <laughs> so as we went along, I would rent a plane and fly an hour or two or three and then run out of money and go for a year or two and not fly. When I was about 45, Barb and I decided I could afford a small plane. I bought a little, what's called a Cherokee 180, a little four seater. I told Barb, we'll never need another airplane. This will be great. I started flying angel flights, and I want to talk about that today because that is why I fly, okay? I don't uh, go bore holes in the sky. I've long passed that. But I fly angel flights, which is basically flying sick folks to their long distance medical appointments. You've been told in Lafayette, Indiana, we can't help you anymore with your cancer or whatever malady you have. But they say there's a clinical trial in Houston or Rochester, Minnesota, and you say, how am I going to get there? That is where the angel flight people come in. We take these folks free of charge to wherever they need to go. I probably do a 30 to 40 of these a year. Thus, this airplane is what I, uh, what I fly these folks in. It's what I do for fun. It clears my mind and helps people. How can it get any better than that, Dan? This is a new airplane for you as well, isn't it? This airplane I bought about six months ago. It's a Beechcraft 58P Baron. Uh, the P stands for pressurized, just like in an airliner. So when we go to 20,000 feet, you're not either sucking on oxygen or can't hardly breathe, or cabin's at about 7,000 feet, like an airliner. Um, what I'm looking at here in front of me is the main navigation, uh, what I look at when I'm flying. This, keep, this tells me my wings are level. This tells me where I'm going. This tape here tells me the airspeed. This tape here tells me the altitude, okay? Um, over here is the two uh, NAVCOM radios, which is uh, both GPS based, and then the communication, which you can hear in the background. Mm -hmm. We got the Lafayette Tower on right now. Um, that, that's where these come in. These are the engine instruments. Uh, the oil pressure, the temperature, uh, the vacuum uh, uh, pressure, and then the exhaust gas temperature, which we have a better um, exhaust gas temperature gauge clear down here, which maybe you cannot see. Is exhaust gas temperature and cylinder head temperature is what we drive everything on these engines. We like to keep them cool, just like your car. So when you have these uh, folks that you're taking to their appointments, do you communicate with them during the flight? Do you interact with them? You know, some guys do. Some people give them a headset and they just chat the whole time. I have come to the conclusion I have a job to do, which is to get them there safely. I'm always talking to the controllers on the ground, uh, so I do not. What, I, about three times during the flight, I, I uh, talk with my passengers. One, when we get to altitude, when we climbed out, the autopilot's flying a plane, and I turn around asking if they're cold, hot, are they okay? And then when we start to descend, I let them know that. And once in a while, uh, I'll, I'll, I just, I, I, I kind of turn like this, I can see in the back, they're usually sleeping. People normally fall asleep. It's kind of soothing, it's a hum, it's usually smooth. So that's how I communicate. Other guys put a headset on them and they chat the whole way. I have felt like that's not my job. Yeah. It's gotta be a satisfying experience for you as well. Dan, the term angel flight came to me one day 25 years ago and I feel the good Lord put it there. And I started doing these and I'm addicted. It's, it's uh, I like to fly for one, but I also like to help people. This past week, I flew two different families. One was a 15-year-old girl and her mother down to St. Jude 
trying to get some answers for their cancer. And the other was a, uh, oh, he's 35 or so, father of three, him and his wife. I picked him up in Rochester, Minnesota. He was fighting um, uh, prostate cancer and had just gotten the news that he was cancer free. Oh well, that's my. great. That yes. is great. So it is very rewarding. I feel incredibly blessed to be able to fly this machine. When I first got my license 40 years ago, this was a pipe dream to me. Mm. I, this was never going to happen for me. And it did. And I'm very grateful. And I'm also blessed I can help people. Absolutely. Do any of these folks uh, keep in touch with you, communicate? Not a lot. Once in a while. Once in a while. Most of the time, regrettably we learn that they passed away at some point in time. When they're in my airplane going to a long distance medical, medical appointment, they're probably not gonna live forever. They may, they may, but they're usually older and they're just fighting to stay alive longer to be with their husband, their wife, their kids, and their grandkids. Some have a miraculous recovery and live an, uh, an extended life. 90% of the people we take are older, looking for some more time with their family, so they it, regrettably at some point in time five years down the road they pass away not always we don't stay in a lot of contact but occasionally we do boy that's going to be pretty humbling isn't it it is very humbling that's a beautiful thing that you're doing though i love to do it how do people find out about the service that you do angel flight if you have a family member that that has this need the best thing you can do is google angel flight and most likely the nearest organization that handles these will come up contact them Tell them your need, tell them what you are looking for, and if they can't help you, they will send you to someone that can. So how does the public find out about Angel Flight? You know, if, you ha if your family member has a need, or you, Google the term Angel Flight, and the nearest organization will pop up, give them a call, tell them your need. If they are not the correct organization, they will send you to the one that is, and then you take it from there. There's a uh, application process, uh, your doctor needs to sign off that you can fly in one of these airplanes, and, and then uh, you can schedule a flight. All right. Brad Neihauser, you are awesome. Thank you for your service. Thank you.